Have you ever looked at a map and wondered, why is 80% of New Zealand, this captivating island nation, so empty? Just 18 people per square kilometre. Intriguing, right? What secrets does this land hold and why does it resist the teeming masses? Well, join us as we unveil this tantalizing mystery exploring the secrets behind New Zealand's vast open spaces. So a long time back, around the years 1320 to 1350, a group of brave Polynesian explorers made a mind-blowing journey. They sailed across the vast, often treacherous Pacific Ocean, guided by nothing but the stars and their deep knowledge of sea currents. Legend has it that a renowned explorer named Gupe led them, navigating through the open ocean like it was his backyard. Their destination, a place that hadn't felt the footfall of humans before, a land so pristine and uncharted, what we now know as New Zealand. Once they arrived, these Polynesian explorers didn't just survive, they thrived, adapting their way of life to match this new environment which was quite different from their tropical home. They started calling themselves the Maori, which pretty much meant ordinary folks in their language, but their life was anything but ordinary. The Maori formed groups or tribes called iwi, kind of like big families, which were further divided into smaller sub-tribes called hapu. These Maori folks had a knack for finding the best spots, setting up fortified villages known as pa on locations with the best views and the best defense. You see, the first European who got a glimpse of New Zealand was a Dutch fellow named Abel Tasman. He landed there in 1642, thinking he had found a part of Statenland, some landmass that's actually over near South America. He didn't have the warmest welcome though. The Maori folks he encountered in Golden Bay weren't too thrilled with these unexpected visitors, and things escalated, leading to the unfortunate deaths of four of Tasman's crew. Tasman did manage to chart the west coast of the North Island from his ship, but he didn't actually step foot on it or meet any friendly Maori. After this somewhat disastrous visit, he took off, leaving New Zealand behind without staking a claim for the Dutch. Next up on the European exploration tour of New Zealand was the British explorer James Cook, arriving in 1769. Unlike Tasman, Cook managed to go around both the North and South Islands, mapping them as he went. He named the place New Zealand after a Dutch province called Zeeland. Cook's interactions with the Maori were a bit of a mixed bag, and he managed to trade with the Maori for essentials like food and water, and also information. In return, he introduced them to new plants, animals, and technologies that were unheard of to them. After Cook's trips, New Zealand started seeing a rise in the number of visitors. Explorers, sailors, missionaries, traders, and adventurers, you name it, they started showing up. They brought new goods, ideas, and also diseases with them, which had a massive impact on the Maori society and local ecosystem. Some of these visitors decided to call New Zealand home, creating relationships or conflicts with the local Maori groups. Thus began the next phase of New Zealand's history, one of interaction, exchange, and inevitably, conflict. So the year was 1840. Representatives of the British Crown and various Maori chiefs met at a place called Waitangi in the Bay of Islands. They gathered to sign this big deal agreement known as the Treaty of Waitangi, or Te Tiriti o Waitangi in Maori. The idea behind this treaty was to set up a British sovereignty over New Zealand, but also to protect Maori rights to their lands, resources, and culture. There was a catch though. The treaty was written in two languages, English and Maori, and those two versions didn't quite match. Different meanings, different interpretations. You can see where this is heading. These discrepancies led to a whole bunch of disputes over who owned what land, who was in charge, and who was officially a citizen. Between 1843 and 72, tensions escalated into a series of armed conflicts which are now known as the New Zealand Wars or Nga Pakanga or Aertonia in Maori. These wars were between Maori tribes who weren't thrilled about British rule or selling their land, and British forces that were sometimes supported by Maori allies. In 1852, Britain decided to grant New Zealand self-government with the Constitution Act 1852, or Te Turi Wakama o Aitoria 1852 in Maori. This act set up a bicameral parliament with a governor representing the British Crown, however this new parliament was dominated by Pakeha, European settlers who tended to pass laws that looked after their own interests more than those of Maori or other minorities. 
The Maori community started to see a significant decline from the late 18th century to the early 20th century. This decline was mainly due to the impacts of European contact and colonization. First up, we've got diseases. When the Europeans arrived, they brought with them all sorts of infectious diseases that the Maori had never been exposed to, and thus had no immunity against. Diseases like measles, influenza, tuberculosis, typhoid, and smallpox. These diseases hit the Maori population hard, causing high mortality rates, particularly among children and the elderly. This was so devastating that between 1840 and 60, the Maori population dropped by 30% due to these epidemics. Then there was the issue of land loss and displacement. Remember that Treaty of Waitangi we talked about earlier? Well, because of the different interpretations of the treaty between the Maori and the Pakeha, land ownership became a hot button issue, leading to all sorts of disputes and conflicts. And then there were the New Zealand Wars, taking place between 1843 to 72. These wars between some Maori tribes and British forces ended with a significant loss of land and resources for the Maori. On top of that, they were politically and socially marginalized. Many Maori were forced to leave their ancestral lands and move to areas that were less fertile or more remote. Even after independence, it's a fascinating thing to realize that about 80% of New Zealand is considered empty. And by that, we mean it's pretty low on the human population side of things. So what's the deal with that? Well, there are a few reasons why things are like this. Firstly, in the grand scheme of things, New Zealand's a bit of a newbie when it comes to human settlement. The Polynesian ancestors of the Maori were the first humans to arrive, and that was only about 700 years ago. Then came the European colonizers in the 18th and 19th centuries. And on top of that, New Zealand is a bit off the beaten track geographically speaking. It's situated in the South Pacific Ocean, miles away from any other major continents. This geographical isolation means that it's had less interaction with other civilizations and cultures. It also means less immigration and fewer trade opportunities. Plus, being a small island nation, it comes with its own set of challenges like having limited resources, dealing with natural disasters, and tackling environmental issues. And let's not forget the lay of the land. A large part of New Zealand is covered in rugged, mountainous terrain, particularly in the South Island where the Southern Alps stretch the length of the island. This can make things like building infrastructure or cultivating land for agriculture or urban development a real challenge. With swaths of the land blanketed by forests, grasslands, wetlands, and even glaciers, these areas are often protected by conservation laws, limiting further human encroachment. While this makes New Zealand incredibly beautiful and ecologically diverse, it also means a bit of a challenge in terms of finding a place to live. Now, the New Zealand government can influence the size and mix of the population. One of the major tools in their kit, immigration policy. You see, New Zealand has a pretty open-minded history when it comes to welcoming immigrants from all over the world and from all walks of life. Immigration has been a big part of the population growth in recent years. But just what this will look like and how it might shape the future of New Zealand, well, that's still a bit of a mystery. And what do you think about all this? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. And see you in the next one.